Hello, it's Deanie, and today I'll be doing another SFF short story discussion where I will be talking about The Court Magician by Sarah Pinsker, and it was published in Lightspeed Magazine. So like usual, I'll start off with a synopsis and then move into my initial thoughts, and then ending on what I think is kind of like the overarching theme for this story. So synopsis time. A young boy wanders the streets, fascinated by the street magicians. He learns their magic, but is disappointed that there are only ever tricks behind them. He develops his own tricks, and they're even greater. It's then that he is given an offer to learn real magic by a palace guard. He's eventually given the position of court magician after learning the ultimate magic word. Through years of service, he sacrifices so much to disappear the regent's problems. A regent who does not care about the court magician and his sacrifices. Eventually, he stops serving, and that is when he learns what powers the magic. He leaves to search what was lost because he still thinks there's always a trick. Okay, so for my initial thoughts of this story, I read it through three times. Because the first time, I was kind of just like, hmm, I don't really know what to think about this story. So then I had to, like, read it through twice, like, two more times, and then it started to, like, click into place. Because it has, like, a very simplistic writing style, and it's not a story that is based on, like, you loving characters or like this super plot base, like it's none of that. It's something completely different. And I was reading a, I was reading other reviews of this story, which there's not many, but I'll link to one that I found that I think it talked about how this is kind of like a fable, like Aesop's fables, where the point is the moral of the story rather than a character or a plot. It, it's trying to tell a message. And so I was like, oh, so that also helped click things into place. I was like, okay, it's not, the point isn't the, you know, whoever this court magician is, there's no plot at all. It is just kind of like a message story. And the message, I think, is kind of like a discussion of power dynamics and how, like, like, magic in this story, the absolute magic, the word that he learns that can, like, disappear problems, that's, like, absolute power. So it's kind of just using magic in place of power and discussing what people would do to get sort of absolute power, how would they react to that situation, what they're willing to like give up. So also with this discussion of power, you have these like power imbalances where the narrator who you find out in the end is just this like disembodied voice, like there's nothing to them, they're just a voice. And so they're kind of grooming people to come into this position of the court magician to serve the regent. And, you know, these people are used as tools. That's why the story, we don't know the court magician's name. It doesn't matter. They're just a tool in the eyes of this, of the narrator of the regent. They don't care who the court magician is as long as they're willing to serve. And then there's a good quote in there where it says, I whisper to him the secret that is that it is powered by the unquenched desire to know what powers it at whatever costs. Only these children, these hungry youths, can wield it, and we wield them for the brief time they allow us. This one longer than most. His desire to lay things bare was exceptional, even if he stopped short of where I did. I, no more than a whisper in a willing ear. So it even talks about how they're wielding these children, these people to, like, serve for however long, and just kind of seeing what these people are willing to do in the position where it said even for the court magician that we're following, it wasn't about lineage or, you know, talent. It was just this person's desire to know what the magic was. But then what is the cost of that magic? What is the cost of power? What are they willing to give up? Because the cost of the magic, it didn't matter if it was like a small request that the regent had or a big request. Their cost was always kind of like the same where the court magician lost something that they loved. So you kind of put yourself into that. What would you be willing to give up for power, for magic? And why would you be willing to give up something that you love just for that? It's a huge sacrifice. So why would you put yourself and keep doing that? And I think that's why it's also like a power dynamic where you had the court, like the previous court magician, the kind of disembodied voice grooming these people where they want them to be like, okay, you want us. You want to be part of this. You have all these great things now, you know, but only for now. 
And then you have another thing added on top to that where this absolute magic leads to sort of peace in a way. There's a quote that says, He considers himself lucky still in a way. The regent is rarely frivolous. Months pass between the regent's requests, years sometimes. A difficult statute, a rebellious province, a potential usurper, all disappear before they can cause problems. There have been no wars in his lifetime. He tells himself his body bears the cost of peace, so others are spared. For a while, this serves to console him. So he has this power, and he trying and he tries to say, I'm doing good, you know, there's no peace. But at what cost? Because there's a personal cost to him, and then there's also the cost of the fact that he is disappearing people. Like the first one he disappears is a woman who is listing her grievances, which is also interesting because at the end of the story, you find out that most likely the woman who was saying kind of like her list of grievances was most likely a former court magician where it's called the mourner's litany where they have a list and now they're just finally speaking out like hey i lost all this thing in a in the pursuit of power and that shows that eventually you'll resent kind of that dynamic that where you have this absolute power but you feel completely helpless because you're still serving this regent who doesn't actually care about you you're serving something that doesn't care and is just using you as a tool. And they kind of eventually realize that. Another quote was, he begins to resent the regent. Why sacrifice himself for the sake of a person who would not do the same for him, who never remarks on the changes in his appearance? The resentment itself is a curse. There is no risk of the regent disappearing. That is not the price. That is not how this magic works. So even though he still has a choice technically to leave, and we see that later on, that eventually he does leave, for a time being, you're still willing to sacrifice yourself because he was still in search of the trick. He just, that's what was driving him throughout this entire thing. But I do want to say, I find it weird that there's no risk of the di regent disappearing. So my question was, what if, th since the person's able to wield this word, has anyone ever tried to use that for themselves instead of just using it for the regent? Like, has anyone tried to be like, think and say the word while thinking about disappearing the regent. Because obviously they're, to some extent, they seem very scared of using this power. One, because it will take away something that they love. But what if they decide to wield it for themselves and be like, how about we disappear the regent and try to just like cause chaos that way? They'll still lose something that they love, but then they'll have disappeared the regent. I want that kind of ending because I think that would have been interesting. That would have been more complicated, but I just wonder if, like, has anyone ever tried that to be like, you know what, I'm done with this life, I want no one to ever have to go through this again. Because that leads into the next thing where former court magicians actually sometimes would serve the disembodied voice and kind of train and again groom new court magicians. So here's where I'm going to get into a little bit of a side tangent about serial killers. Because the part where it talked about, like, how when some court magicians leave, they kind of stay on to tutor the new court magician, my mind went to this serial killer that I remember. <laughs> it was in Mindhunter at one point, and I'm pretty sure I listened to it in some podcast as well. So it's about a serial killer named Dean Coral who would kind of lure teenage boys into his home and torture and then kill them. And so at that one point, one of the boys that got lured in, he, well, Dean also would, had like a teenage accomplish, accomplice. And then at one point, that teen brought in another teen named Elmer. Is that his name? Yeah. Elmer was supposedly supposed to be a victim, but then ended up becoming another accomplice and luring people in until at one point, Dean got mad at Elmer for bringing in a woman instead of just men to his house, wanted to kill Elmer, and then eventually Elmer shot and then killed Dean. So that showed kind of this, he was a victim, but also an accomplice, and like, these power dynamics. So for some reason, this story made me think of that, where it's like, you have these power imbalances where the teen could have gone to the police right away, but instead chose to become an accomplice. 
we're at. Same with this. You have these powers where the court magicians, they will still be part of the system and stay in that system and train new court magicians. And so it's just like, well, why does that happen? I don't know. I don't know the psychology behind that, but it is still kind of a true thing that happens, which is really terrifying. You would think that it kind of depends where some people become in the story. They'll go outside and list their grievances and do the mourner's litany, whereas others kind of stay or others, again, just they disappear themselves. They just kind of like they try to move on with their life as much as they can. But then I do wonder about the kind of disembodied voice because we always because there was a part of the story that talked about how the magic won't take away kind of like your hearing, your voice, you'll need like your remaining you need your tongue, your you know, your remaining teeth to be able to say the word. So then I think about like how did this magic eventually take what was a court magician and turn them into this disembodied voice that still, you know, it seems to be kind of like this all-knowing, they can talk still, they can hear, they can have thoughts and whatnot. So what happened to the magic there? Like, why did that happen? Did it come to a point where they had literally nothing left in their life that they cared about other than kind of like their corporal form? So then that just disappeared, and so then they now can't serve the regent anymore because they have nothing left to lose. Because that's what, that was my question, was like, why do we still need court magicians if there's still this one, like, voice left? Why can't this voice just continue going on? But then if the magic is true, and that, that the price is always something that you're willing to give up, if you have nothing left to give up, then I guess you can't use that power anymore. So in which that case, I guess... The disembodied voice narrator was like, I guess we'll just be part of, you know, we'll just keep going because I have nothing else to lose. So you just lose your soul. You lose everything at that point. But overall, I did think after kind of rereading it three times, it was an interesting kind of like thought process of like power dynamics, what people would be willing to sacrifice. Like, is the cost too much? What, how much would you be willing to give up or kind of disappear to utilize this absolute magic. So I guess my questions for you all are, what did you think of the story? Did you kind of catch on to all those like little details like the mourner's litany where it was like that woman was probably a former court magician? What did you think of like the reveal that it was like this disembodied voice as the narrator? What did you think of like the simplistic writing style? Did it work for you? Did it not? Do you have any other ideas about the power dynamics that you saw in this story? Did it make you think of anything else like me with the serial killer story? You know, just let me know your thoughts. And thank you for watching.